Hello to all of you, and uh, happy new year, and etc. etc. Um, probably you are much interested in that subject because of a COP21 conference in Paris. And as you noticed, it was uh, denounced by all the newspapers. Aircraft was not included in the declaration. And uh, since I was one of the uh, reporters in the European Parliament at the time of the first great battle about introducing airplanes into the system of uh, the community system in order to fight against climate change, I took that opportunity <laughs> to present to you the battle at that time because it was perfectly uh, exemplar of a problem that you meet when you want to introduce aviation but also uh, marine into, uh, the, uh, into the system of the international, any international system uh, fighting against climate change. And it was also an opportunity for you <laughs> to discover uh, the kind of literature that we vote in the European Parliament. So I gave you several uh, papers. I'm sure that all of you did not read the papers. And, uh, and yet, some are very interesting, but we will focus on the vote of the Parliament in 2007 and the reaction it provoked. Well, first of all, I hope that everybody is aware of what is the greenhouse effect. Is there some problem with that? I have just one point to, uh, I have something to point out. Yet, the greenhouse effect is basically the fact that the rays coming from the sun are, of course, reflected by the earth all along the, the, the day and night, but under a weaker form, which are normally. Um, infrared rays, and these infrared rays are captured into in the atmosphere. So there is a tendency, and this is a greenhouse effect, uh, for the temperature of the atmosphere to climb on. An important point for aviation is that when you deal with aviation, it is not only the emission of carbonic, uh, carb carbon dioxide which is important. The monoxide of or various oxides of nitrogen are as much important. And also the fact that they provoke cyrus and trains, which are part of a greenhouse effect. So I will every time speak of greenhouse effect and CO2 emission, but in reality you have to multiply by a factor which is specific to that industry. Well, what are the methods to combat, to fight against climate change and any uh, ecological problem? There are three. One is morality, civic sense. Civic sense is very important in politics, of course. It's the basis of democracy, as Montesquieu said. But it is also very important in politics. It is all the chapter of reputation effects. A firm which has been a liar, uh, we have a serious problem on the stock exchange and uh, even with consumers. We have a problem with Volkswagen today. And uh, so it's very important to take into account that point. Uh, of course, it could lead to green uh, washing, as uh, we say, that is, have a good reputation and not while doing nothing. But it is important in economics. Not only in political economy, but in classical economics, neoclassical economics. Second system is regulation, public regulation. Public regulation could be a prohibition, uh, norms, norms are very important, and quota. Quota is an administrative decision, but when you transform it into a system of exchange of quotas, it turns into an economic device. And 
Lastly, you have the so-called economic tools where you put taxes, eco-taxes, that you tax emission of pollution. I insist on that because it is a very silly distinction. If you are aware, civic sense, and reputation effect, admin, and economic device. If you put tax here, and um, transferable permits, that is, quota which you can sell, you see that it's a bit stupid. This one is often called economic tool. And that one is also called economic tools while it is directly an administrative tool. And uh, for the point of view of the economist, of course, tax is just to change the system of price and then the agent plays freely with it. There you take the decision of capping the total of production, of emission, of pollution, and then there is a trade. Where is it more administrative and more economics? It's very hard to say. From the point of view of economic theory, from uh, mm, classical theory, Adam Smith, uh, Ricardo, Marx, this is captured by the theory of rent. The theory of rent says that this, the price of a transferable permit, is only the actualization of a tax, or on the contrary, the tax is just the price of a transferable permit, which is divided, split by year or by month or by small unities. Uh, it's a difference between buying a flat and renting a flat. You, know, you have just to make the actualization and you transform the, with one and to the other. This is captured also by neoclassical theory, who say that once you cap the total of emission, you put a constraint that could be interpreted into the tax or a change in the system of price. Of course, the, the, the permits are uh, different from the tax. The tax are normally directly going to the state or into an interprofessional or professional uh, body. Uh, for instance, in France, the system of uh, collect, collecting the baggage is a, a, a professional tax, a redevance. Uh, but a transferable permit depends on what? On the allowance. There is a new theory of non-orthodox non uh, part of economics by Williamson about the point of allowance. There is nothing natural in allowance. Huh? Uh, the property of land is a result of whole history of the battles of feudality, etc., etc. Uh, the property of the right to emit a pollution is given today by the state. So it's a creation of an, a right of an allowance. If this allowance is given to uh, the beneficiary, then it is a gift, and there is nothing accruing to a state. If the state sells uh, the allowance, it's completely different. If there is um, uh, an auction system to sell uh, from the state to uh, the user of a permit, then a tax is accruing, a revenue is accruing uh, to a state. You see? No problem there? Okay. So, so that was a pro that, these are the tools which were available after the Kyoto, uh, or even for after the Rio Agreement. At, the Rio, uh, at Rio in 1992, when the United Nations Convention on Climate Change was proclaimed, the tax was defeated and the transferable permits was fostered. Why? Because it was classified at the time as an economic device. But immediately when <laughs> it was implemented, 
uh, as we see, by, United, by uh, EC, Euro, uh, European Community, and then European Union. Immediately, it was transformed into a problem of allowance, that is, a political and an administrative problem, that is, the capacity for the state to say, until, until then, it was free, you can admit what you want. Now, I say, stop. And uh, it's a good difference. Uh, in English, this system is called cap and trade. The cap and trade. This is very interesting because <laughs> this is completely administrative, the power of a prince, and this appears completely market. So you can consider it as you want, but anyway, anyway, there is a first step, which is the allowance. That firm has the right to emit this quantity of uh, carbon dioxide and uh, a multiplier of the carbon dioxide. And if it wishes, okay, it could sell it to another firm. And then we, we go to the trade aspect. In Europe, I mean, in the Europe of the uh, Treaty of Rome, this is a big difference. Why? Because in the Treaty of Rome, which instituted uh, EU, EC first, and then EU, uh, trade is the objective. We should reach what is called in English, and this is a very important word to remember, a level playing, playing field. That is a field of playing, which is level. That is like a football uh, place. That's, this is the image of cricket. Cricket place. In French, for instance, it's translated as um, concurrence libre et non faussé. If you look at the French version of any text which is published in English, this is a French translation. I didn't check how it is in Spanish, etc. In English, and all the debate in, uh, in Europe has made in this, in English, so we use level playing field. That is the idea that a commodity which is circulating into, in, within EU is within a level playing field. There is no differences in the field. Huh? Uh, there's not a uh, year uh, before the goal, <laughs> uh, in front of the goal. Uh, it is completely flat. The law is the same everywhere and for any commodity coming from EU. For the rest of the world, ah, it's different. There could be a common tariff system. So, uh, the tax, on the contrary, that is, cap, no, not the cap, but the tax, on the contrary, is national in the Treaty of Rome. That is, European Parliament, or a majority of uh, the room of governments, which is called the European Council, you see there are two rooms in Europe, like in most constitutions, there is one which is represents the citizens and one which represents the states. The states, uh, the room of the state is called the Conseil Européen, European Council. The rooms of the citizen is the European Parliament, which is directly elected. A tax, a common tax at the EU level, can be voted only by the Council at, the, at unanimity. It is not a communitary measure. Uh, on the contrary, trade is a community measure, that is, all the measures, uh, all the legislation concerning 
trade are community measures. That is, that can be, they can be voted at the majority of the parliament and of the council. As a result, when we had to choose between that and that, it was possible to a majority of states to impose a cap and trade because of a trade aspect of it, but not a tax system. It was a very long battle. During years and years, the Green and the European Parliament tried to say, well, at least within Europe, who could tax kerosene? That is, uh, uh, the stuff for, for airplanes. Uh, but one country could say, no, I don't accept. And there, was, there is always one country to say no. So it is impossible to have a tax. We tried a lot of time. We had majorities at the parliament that we ever failed. Uh, on the contrary, a cap of and trade could be voted at the level of parliament and at the majority of the council. And that's the main reason why a cap and trade was uh, fostered and not a tax system within the parliament. There is another theory. There is another important point uh, for that, a very practical one. We are roughly half a billion inhabitants in Europe. It is impossible to put a cap and trade system on all these <laughs> half a billion inhabitants. You can say uh, you have a right to produce uh, this quantity of carbon dioxide uh, every year. But if you restrict to the main, not firms, but establishments, that is a practical, uh, a practical uh, spot uh, uh, of production, they, you can control, say, uh, around 5,000 or 6,000 spots of production, controlling a great quantity of emission. So Europe decided to put a cap and, track, a cap and trade system on these main industrial establishments. But why not on aviation? Oh, just before, just one point to, to, to explain also. This idea of putting, of, uh, putting uh, in place uh, a trade and cap system rather than a tax was also the, tra the translation of a Kyoto Agreement. A Kyoto Agreement, mainly for the same reasons, was a cap and trade system. Kyoto Agreement is uh, uh, decided around uh, 1999, I think, and implemented slowly. Uh, the fact that there should be, for all the countries uh, accepting the Kyoto Agreement, which was not a majority, uh, uh, there should be a trade and cap system between them, exactly for the same reasons, more or less. Uh, uh, so, EU decided to put a trade and cap system uh, in Europe. But you see that this implies a choice about what do you cap. Do you cap the emission of carbon dioxide or rather in general uh, greenhouse effect gas, which are produced on the place, or do you cap the quantity of carbon dioxide which are produced anywhere within the consumption of a place. You see the difference? You are a French or an English or a Belgian, etc. You, you are consumers and by your consumption you produce gas. These gas are also produced when a productor produces a commodity. So there are two places where the greenhouse effects are produced at the level of their production or at the level of consumption of a commodity or of a service. Okay? This is the point of view of a Kyoto Agreement. You cap and trade these two quantities. That is, you cap everything that goes out the nation one year, one year, okay? 
But today, uh, in, 19, uh, in 2016, you will not say that spontaneously. You would say, you would speak of footprint. That is, you will take what is the quantity of gas, of green effect gas, which is produced either by your consumption or by the production of the community, wherever the production took place. If you, you are in Belgium, for instance, your footprint is not only what, uh, uh, what is produced, what is emitted during the production of what you consume but in, in, in Belgium, but also what is emitted when the product that you consume is produced, for instance, in India, or in China, or in Morocco. That is a footprint. When you say that Europe consumes uh, two and a half planets, uh, it means that uh, of greenhouse effect, it, it, it says that if the planet had the same footprint as Europe, it would be two and a half times the planet. And uh, this is a great difference. More and more, the south southern country says you have to take into account the footprint and not the local production. Because in China, in India, in Morocco, we produce a lot of cement, of toys, of electronics, etc., which are consumed in Europe. We are taking your production, your pollution in our place. It should not be put in our cap, in our allowance. At the time, 2007, there was a tendency to think in terms of footprint, a tendency. But it was not the official point of view. In Rio, in Kyoto, and uh, at the time in 2007, there was nothing about footprint. It was just appearing at the time. And uh, for that reason, it was very important to have a theory of trade and climate change at the same time as we thought about introducing aviation into the system of cap and trade uh, in Europe, which I did. But before, I have to tell you why aviation is not into uh, the not even the EC system of cap and trade, uh, but even in the European, no, in the world, in the world Kyoto Agreement. It's because of something which happened in the 12th century, which is called the Rôle d'Oléron. The Rôle d'Oléron is a text written under the responsibility of Aliénor d'Aquitaine, which is a very, very famous queen of Europe, in Europe, married to French kings, married to British kings, English kings. Uh, it was not British at the time, it was English. And uh, one of the most important, much more than Olympe de Gouges, important woman in the history, huh? which, which had a huge responsibility political responsibility under, under the two kings of France and of uh, England. And uh, in her city, which was proper to her, her property, Oléron, she made a, the first code of maritime right, and, uh, which is still in, char in force. Once I was discussing at the intergovernmental meeting uh, of uh, WTO, and uh, Deputy Secretary, uh, General Secretary of the WTO said to me, uh, you cannot put any environmental law which is after an older law. WTO is older than your law, than any environmental agreement. So you cannot introduce international environmental agreement which has an effect on trade if you don't change before the WTO the World Trade Agri uh, Organization Treaty. The role de Léron are much older than anything. Only, uh, uh, well, 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 well. Oh yes, the health organization, the World Health Organization is more powerful than 
WTO, because health, uh, World Organization, uh, has the right to say uh, the export in, in this country, there is a um, foot and mouth uh, illness of cows, so no cow can be exported from this country. And the WTO has nothing to say. So, uh, because this regulation is nearly uh, at the same time as the whole de Liron. 12th or 15, uh, 12th or 14th century, I don't remember. So you have the right to say you cannot impose to aviation a taxation on, uh, on what is consumed during the flight because Aliénor d'Aquitaine said that everything which is consumed during a flight, uh, not a flight, and, well, the same, it was just a, <laughs> a maritime <laughs> trade. Eh? Everything which is consumed, the saving, uh, uh, the rum for uh, the food uh, for the uh, sailors, everything which is consumed during the trade could not be taxed neither in the exporter country nor in the importing country. As a result, you cannot tax neither maritime trade nor aviation trade. But if you have not the right to tax, you have the right to, to put transferable permits. And that was the idea that was developed by the Council, the European Council, and the Commission, which is the government of the EU. Remember, you have the it's a normal constitution. You have a parliament, you have a council, and you have an executive, which is the EU, EU uh, Commission. The Commission, on the indication of the council, decided to prepare the integration of aviation within the system of ETS, the transferable uh, system of uh, permits of EU, when we call that ETS, huh? European Transfer uh, Trading System. When you see ETS, it's European Trading System of what? <laughs> of permits of pollution. Huh? Uh, so, facing the problem of uh, the opposition of aviation due to the rôle de Liron, we introduced by this process, the possibility to impose the integration of aviation within the ETS, which exist, existed around uh, from uh, 2005, I think. So what did we do? Well, we are now the parliament, and we try to do better than the commission, as the parliament is <laughs> normally in charge of doing. Uh, the commission is Look, we are under the pressure, we, I think, the deputies, a member of the European Parliament, of any parliament, are under the pressure of the opinion and lobbies. Governments are nearly only under the pressure of lobbies. And Commission, of course, is nearly totally under the pressure of lobbies. Even the, the poor, the unemployed, have to constitute, to constitute themselves into lobbies in order to be influential on the uh, Commission. They are powerful. Even the unemployed have their representation in Brussels, uh, which, are, which is financed by the, the churches, principally. And they, they can speak to the Commission. Yes? Oh, it is completely official. That is, you have rooms. If you go to Brussels, huh? there is nearly uh, okay, we went there. You, you went there. You went there. Uh, everybody, there are nearly streets made only of <laughs> office of lobbies. You have a card. You can go into a parliament. And it's really a lobby. Lobby comes from an uh, English word, uh, couloir. Huh? Uh, and uh, the European Parliament in Brussels has a huge lobby, I mean a physical lobby. And they are all along. You can also build a stand, uh, a little house to present uh, you, and you, you, you catch uh, the member of parliament who are going to the room where they vote, 
and uh, you give them papers and you see the last uh, uh, proposition by the commission and we would like to discuss with them. And I, I was elected uh, first, I was elected the first time the constituency was France. We were elected at French level. I was not accountable to uh, any French person in particular, it was impossible. Uh, the second election was by region, I had 10 million, I had 10 millions of electors. I cannot talk to 10 millions of people. So th the only contact that you have practically in, uh, the, in Brussels are with the lobbies. But some of them are attacked as a lobby. Uh, the the uh, alter mondialists are, are constituted into a lobby. Uh, the, the unemployed are lobby. The, the poor, the excluded are, have a lobby, which is uh, organized by, as I told you, financed by churches. Uh, but of course, uh, aviation has a lobby, banking has a lobby, uh, insurance has a lobby. The main support to the green battles is insurance, of course, or reinsurance, more precisely. That is the one what are Insurance is the industrial activity which is computing every time what is the cost today to avoid a, bi a bigger cost later. Exactly what are the green doing in politics. Huh? So <laughs> we, we were much supported by the insurance and uh, they came to see me, for instance, when I was in charge of uh, 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 the, 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 the directive on the civil responsibility uh, on environmental uh, damages. Of course, it was a problem of insurance. And I had a lot of contact with them, very useful. Uh, they made all the compute I, I wanted. I asked them, what is the price to avoid? What, what would be the price, for instance, of avoiding uh, the pioneer, that is a substance that kills uh, the bees? Uh, by comparison of the cost of the disappearance of the bees, that is a typical problem for insurance. And uh, so the lobbies are the normal expression of civil society in half a billion constituency, which is EU. Okay? So can I put this very simple definition of lobbying pressure? Like, lobbies come to you and say, for example, the Green Party is lobbying. I will speak, or what they, do I say? Yes. And if aviation really does not support we, we are going to see what they did in aviation. <laughs> uh, no, of course, in many laws, directive or uh, regulation which are voted, it's very easy to see what are the members of parliament who are just presenting as an amendment what the lobby <laughs> had asked you to present as an amendment. They said, ha ha, this girl or this guy has <laughs> accepted the pressure <laughs> of the lobby for any reason. Of course, we are not. Uh, I, have, I have a, re a reputation of being incorruptible. But this does not mean that, that I was not under the pressure of a lobby. Uh, the, I see, for instance, uh, uh, Con Bendit, who is a president of a green group. You received a lot of lobbies by IBM during the regulation uh, on uh, the right of property on, uh, 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 on um, software. And we, we received a lot of pressures by lobbies. And it was incredible the quality of IBM in his lobbying. For each person, he, uh, she or he had exactly the kind of uh, lobbyist which was uh, more convincing for him. There was an actor for uh, one of the deputy, a green deputy, who was herself an actor, an actress. Uh, for Con Bendit, it was a, a pure intellectual, New Yorkese intellectual, uh, Jewish intellectual. And uh, they discussed in a way which is extremely precise. Of course, when we try to defend the poor, of the un, uh, unemployed, of uh, human rights in, uh, in uh, Colombia, for instance, which was, was my responsibility, uh, they sent uh, bishops. 
of, uh, of the international branch of uh, human action of the churches. Uh, so lobbying is, at Vosselles, is extremely clever, and it is accepted because it is our only contact with civil society. We are not going to discuss with everyone uh, half a billion of inhabitants. So, uh, the lobby of, uh, uh, of aviation, by the way, is called international uh, sea is what? Huh? Yeah? Uh, no, of uh, civil aviation organization. Huh? ICAO. It is not only a lobby. It is an organization. That is, it is a professional organization of aviation. The regulation on aviation, of international aviation, is made by this. And then, they introduce it into the European, the national legislation, the airports, etc., etc. So it's both a lobby and an organization, a real organization, like a United Nations organization. But it's much older. Huh? It's much older than the European Union. Now, as to give you a world to understand the situation, about what was the situation in 2007. 2007 is the peak of the concern of the world, in fact, uh, in favor of battling against climate change. It's the peak. Why? We are preparing the Copenhagen uh, meeting, the COP, uh, I don't remember the number, uh, of the uh, United Nations uh, Convention on Climate Change. At the time, the price of Another, in the cycle of this model of accumulation that we experimented between 1920 and 2007, the price, the activity, the development of wage labor in China and India, etc., etc., uh, the demand for uh, raw material, uh, the demand for oil was peaking, the consumption, the, the pollution was peaking never so high. Uh, the price of food was uh, soaring, and uh, there was really a crisis of other accumulation, which was growing. And of course, everybody was thinking about what could we do. And so there was really a commitment of the council, the majority of the council, the majority of the commission and the majority of parliament and the majority of opinion to say, well, next year it's Copenhagen, and etc. You have to prepare it. Uh, Europe must prepare it itself uh, for uh, to be the leader in uh, this uh, uh, meeting. And everybody was preparing to do something and introduce the aviation by the transfer permit system into the one which already existed, that is the 2003 uh, uh, regulation on cap and trade at the European level. In order to foster uh, uh, the consciousness around the European Parliament, I took the initiative, uh, my committee well, took the initiative to give me, uh, what is a committee? Uh, a parliament is split in two committees. In French, it's commission also, so you imagine uh, the, con the confusion, but in English, there is no problem. The executive is called the commission, and the splitting or according to the different uh, subjects of the parliament are called committees. I was member of the Committee of Economic Affairs and members of the Committee of the Trade Affairs and of Legal Affairs too, and uh, because I was old, <laughs> you know, the responsibility increased in the parliament with the time, because you are, um, you are experimented. And I proposed a report on trade and climate change. It, was, well, it is one of the papers. Huh? I, I, I asked you to read, but of course, it's, it's a bit long. Uh, very little. Don't worry. Yeah, don't worry. Because it's old, but it's very interesting. It's old. I think it's 12 years old. Huh? Uh, but it's interesting uh, because it proves several two things. The first, the existence of 
well, no, three things. First, aviation is not nothing. Aviation is, or is not nothing. <coughs> aviation is already very important in the trade, in, in the emission uh, greenhouse effect, mainly because of trade. You know, but that trade that is international trade. Huh? Uh, in English, we say trade, or at the European Parliament, we say trade for international trade and uh, competition for inner trade. Huh? It's a great difference. Trade, according to Adam Smith, in fact, huh? uh, or even Marx, uh, is between community. Commerce is within community, huh? communities. So, uh, trade increased twice faster than the world gross product during all this period. And within that, air, air transportation uh, increased twice faster than anything, any other form of transport. Of course, it was mainly in trade, not within the countries. Within a country like France, People prefer to send bus, lorries, uh, um, trains, etc. At the end, in the international trade, there was a growth of airplane, which was extremely important. Uh, if you look at uh, sea, sea transportation, sea transportation is 40 times less producing of uh, greenhouse effect per kilometers and ton. Uh, but it's, of course, uh, much uh, less than aviation because uh, it is much more producing uh, in greenhouse uh, gas because the, the transport by boats is much more important than by airplane. But the airplane increase very quickly. For instance, Roissy produces, Roissy is the airport, Charles de Gaulle. The airport in, the, in Paris produces as much as the rest of Paris as a rest of uh, road transportation in Paris. So you see, it's very important. This is the, uh, one reason to vote something. Second, uh, in some case, that is highly intense, highly energy intensive industries, the taxation through the cap and trade, through the cap, that is, principally, uh, is very important. In cement, at the time, the price of cement in Europe was produced in Europe. Produced, huh? There was no footprint uh, aspect at the time. Uh, at the time, the, foot, the, the price of cement was, for half of it, the price of a permit. The permit, uh, at the time, because the, the, the growth was extremely fast, the allowance of permits of pollution was such, was sufficiently low, let us say, eh? so that the price of a permit was significant, significantly, ah, significantly high. That is something like uh, $10 per barrel, 10 euro per, per barrel. Eh? So the price in cement was nearly half, uh, the permits of uh, emission was nearly half the price of cement. As a result, of course, there was a tendency of the firms producing cement in Europe and for Europe to produce cement elsewhere, mainly in Morocco, Turkey, Greece. Greece was in, uh, no, Greece was already in Europe, so it moved from Greece to Turkey, from France to Morocco, from Spain to Morocco. So the problem appeared of what to do with countries which are not within uh, the ETS, or within the agreement of Kyoto. And there was a possibility to introduce a tax barrier, which is called um, um, border tax adjustment. It is permitted within the WTO. And I tried in my report on the trade and climate change to introduce by I the idea that you can introduce a border tax adjustment. There was another solution. All of that is uh, explained uh, within this report. Uh, you can introduce a modification in WTO legislation. It's more difficult, of course. Uh, WTO is, says basically that a commodity somewhere should be treated the same way, whatever be the 
place where it was produced. You can put a legislation prohibiting uh, that form of plastic, but it will be the same for any commodity containing that form of plastic. But the problem is that the wording in the WTO defined the product and not the way the product was produced. So there is, uh, from the beginning, in fact, a tendency, a huge battle of the ecologists, but not only them, to say, no, we have to transform the word product by product and production method, the PPM with indication. PPM amendment. So another solution was to say, we have to treat the same way all the, the commodity which are the same product or according to the same production methods. If you say that, if in some places there is a legislation that permit to produce in a way and not in another country, then it is two products different, two different products. The battle started as far as the cows, you know, the, the veals. Huh? The veals with a... <laughs> Uh, dop, <laughs> doping, uh, uh, hormonic uh, dopage, and the veils without are, for Europe, not the same. For WTO, they are the same. And this is a problem. Um, so, this report fosters the debate on PPM, on border tax adjustment, and also introduced the argument of footprint. Since the cement is not produced, is now produced in Morocco for France, for instance, or Spain, what, what should we consider? It's a very difficult debate. You can consider that moving from production to footprint aspect is a barrier against the production in Morocco. Many people say, say the center left or even Christians, people involved in the, develop, in the development issues of the third world, of the former so third world, said we have to permit the third world to produce in a different way than in Europe because the burden is too heavy for them. Uh, so we have to free them. Uh, is the, uh, my starving children argument in uh, international negotiation. Huh? I was in a, in a negotiation with a WTO before a uh, negotiation before uh, Singapore, I think. And I had a very hard argument with uh, the Minister of Finance of, uh, of India. Uh, he said, we are not able to support all these social and uh, ecological regulation that you have in Europe because we are too poor, but later we'll do it. I said, we introduced, uh, just before UNICEF had produced a report saying there were people, children of three years old in factories of matches in India. I said, I gave this, that example and said, the prohibition of dangerous work in factories, uh, in French factories, uh, children under six years old is in France uh, 1843. At the time, there was no electricity. There was no atomic power. There was no informatics. There was just some machines, steam machines, that's all. And our level of development was much, much, much under the Indian today uh, level of development. He said, no, but uh, the relative level of development is quite different. And uh, so, the My Starving Children is, was a very important argument in favor of avoiding this aspect of footprint. Because if you put a barrier, a tax, a border tax adjustment at the entry of EU, this is protectionist against, against the less developed countries. That is one point, uh, one view of the argument. On the contrary, if you had said that someday, not in the near future, there will be a trans transferable permit system all over the world, then, of course, even China says, ah, this is not our greenhouse emissions. It is your greenhouse emission. When you produce a product for France, this 
emission of gas should be put into uh, the, uh, the cap of France, not of China. These arguments are completely contradictory. If you are a country, a developing country, which want to develop by exporting, you will say any form of any, any move towards footprint point of view will induce protectionist barrier against, uh, uh, against developing countries. If you see, say that we are a developing country, we have not to take on our, shul our shul shoulders today, maybe later, uh, the, the bargain, the, the, uh, uh, the weight of uh, this legislation, then you will, have, you will be in favor of a footprint. So, what were, what were there then? After this debate on trade and climate change, I was uh, in charge of a report of uh, IMAC, I think, or in time, I don't remember. IMAC is the Economy and Monetary uh, Committee, Affairs Committee, and INTA is the International Trade Committee. I don't remember which, I was a reporter in one of the two commissions, which was in charge, committee, sorry, which was in charge of the preparation on the debate on introducing aviation in the ETS system. And I use all the argument I told you, and other ones. First, this one, level playing field. <laughs> if there is a tax in some countries which is not existing or uh, uh, the obligation to buy a transferable permit in a country and not in another one, in another one, this is typically a, uh, a not a not level playing field. Uh, there is an uneven playing field. Uh, so I use the argument of competition. I am not in favor, as you know, I am a regulationist. I am not a fanatic of competition, but when you can use it, <laughs> Don't worry, you can use it. Second, I use the argument of um, we need a border tax adjustment, huh? uh, which was more or less introduced by my report on trade and climate change. And I use a, a last argument, which are the newcomers. The newcomers' problem is that, the problem of allowance. How do we cap? and trade. You cap and trade either by distributing allowance at the beginning of a year. You cap first. You cap. The commission caps by allocating allowance to each firm at the, of aviation, for instance, or cement, at the beginning of a year. What is the rule? In general, we use the grandfathering method. The grandfathering method said we take the average emission of a period in the past and this right of emission, which is the right of the grandfather, is the right of tomorrow, but the right of tomorrow has to be diminished by a factor of, say, 5% according to the target of reduction of emissions. So I said, mm. If you, allocate, if, you, uh, if you allocate the rights, the permits, according to the grandfather, grandfathering method, that will be a problem for the, the newcomers. You know that there are a lot of new young companies in the world every year, and especially in Europe because of the arrival in Europe of all the eastern countries at the time, in 2007, I remember. Uh, new Hungarian, uh, po uh, Polish, uh, uh, Slovenian, etc. country coming with their new companies. And also the low-cost companies. So how to allocate permits to new companies? There, are no grand there is no grandfather there, so it's a decision. So I said, the more there will be auction in the distribution of allowance, the greater it will be because, as you know, auction gives more money uh, to, uh, <laughs> to the states and to, to, to the public uh, treasury than the system of allowing freely uh, uh, the, the different uh, actors. So that were, that, that were more or less the different uh, uh, stakes. 
uh, with a different uh, problem at stake. So what happens? We won. Basically, we won. We won. We said we'll take the grandfathering at the year 2010, less 10%, and that will be the cap of the year 2011. That was a great victory. And then we reduce according to the less 20% or less 30% objective, which was not yet decided, but in the year 2008 was not so good as the year 2007 for the, for the ecologists. Second, we put a very important part of the allowance distributed by auction. 75 distributed freely at the beginning of the year, 25 by auction. This permitted a lot of place to, for newcomers. And third, and uh, of course, accruing a lot of money to the states. Uh, third, we said, atten at take attention to this, that aviation should not be permitted to buy the rice from cement industry. So there should be a kind of barrier of SAS huh, between the, the, the other old and uh, more prioritary industry, like cement industry, and the market in, uh, in, 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 in uh, for aviation. What was the re reaction of uh, OC? Uh, ICAO, of course, absolutely against. We want to do nothing against climate change. And this is still their position, more or less. More or less. Uh, there is some commitment to, to decide something this year, 2016, for the year 2020. It's a commitment which appeared much later. But in 2007, they said, we will do nothing. As Bush said, uh, our model of development is not, uh, uh, our model of civilization is not negotiable. And they were very powerful because of the uh, Aigle de Léon, Aigle de Léon. Second, they attacked through the countries which are, are against the Kyoto Agreement. This is the letter I ask you to, to read, huh? which gives you an idea of what is political uh, aspects of negotiation. This is a letter of April 2007 to the representants, uh, all the representatives. I, I gave you the one given to the permanent uh, representative of Germany at the European Union. But it's signed by Australia, Canada, China, Japan, Korea, and United States, which was nearly, if you do that, we declare, we declare war, <laughs> more or less. Uh, I said they are not going to declare war. Uh, I was completely wrong, they did. Uh, and uh, uh, so we voted what I told you. It was a great victory. I was very pleased of this victory. But immediately after that, what they did, they said, OK, we don't buy any Airbus while this is implemented. They did not ask the WTO to say it was a default, it was a fault in front of a WTO agreement. So we, we, are, uh, we are allowed not to buy Airbus products, but they decided we will not buy Airbus products. And immediately the Commission said, OK, 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 we stop. If you try to read what happened later, I finished there. <laughs> uh, there was a stop of the clock <laughs> decision. Uh, it's very common to EU processes. Uh, stop of clock, that is, in the year 2013, Europe decided to implement this agreement, this uh, regulation, only within the EEE. The EEE is European uh, space economic space. That is, it's broader than EU. But it's not much. That is, a plane, when a plane leaves Europe to go to Europe, it pays or it buys, it buys yes, he has to buy a permit. If it goes from United States to Europe or back, nothing to pay. So you see, the, the, <laughs> we had to, to stand back because uh, the power of finance of an industry such as aviation and the power of the countries which are supporting business 
is such that EU cannot take really a decision. Not because of the WTO. They did not use the WTO. They just said, OK, we boycott Airbus. Who are these countries? I give you the, that will be my last word. I told you, Australia, Canada. By the way, Harper was defeated. That's a good thing. Uh, China and Japan and United States. You see, there are two different kinds of countries. And Korea. Two different uh, kinds of countries. And uh, the geopolitics of it is extremely clear. You have first the just scan. The just scan. Japan, United States, uh, Canada, and uh, New Zealand, and Australia huh? are the countries who say no to any regulation against climate change. From 1992, the JSCAN is uh, the, if, you, if you try to make a difference between the countries from 92. You know, say the developing countries, the South, say, and the North country, and within the North country, there are countries in favor of doing nothing, and the countries in favor of doing something. Huh? And uh, here is a just scan. Here is EU. Here is the Association of Small Island uh, Houses, small islands. And uh, here you have emerging countries. That is China, Korea, etc. We do nothing because of uh, my starving children. Uh, so, and you have Bangladesh, of course, the countries which are absolutely under the pressure of climate change. Either because they will, be, they will dis disappear under the sea or because the weight of agriculture is enormous in, in their G GDP. So you see, the opposition of JESCAN is such that it was impossible to do anything. The compromise of COP21 in Paris was a wonderful compromise under the pressure of these ones between these ones. I say wonderful. I didn't believe in, in it. Of course, nobody will believe it is not like Kyoto Agreement, where it was a system which was extremely well built, but involving only these ones. On the contrary, the COP21 involves all of them. But it is not binding. Which means what? That any country, any NGO in any country can attack its own government in front in front of its national justice, saying, we have signed this commitment. We have to implement it. It is not an bo international body which will do it. It will be local justice that will do it. So it is not binding internationally, but it is binding nation nationally, according to the legislation, uh, administrative justice of a country. The first country that did it was Netherlands. Netherlands, in Netherlands, an NGO went to justice and said, my government is not implementing its commitment in front of international environment agreement. And so I attack it. And they won. And they won. So you see, when, when it is not binding, it means it is not internationally binding, but it is politically binding. And any NGO could use it as a tool to attack its own government. Aviation reacted saying, we are not doing anything, but tomorrow we'll do something. The ICAO made a commitment that in 2016, they will introduce some form of regulation so that in 2020, they will do something. It is not in the capital. It's a statement of the ICAO. ICAO. OK, thank you for your attention. OK, so thank you, Professor Lipitz, for being here. And it was a really an engaging conversation. You already pointed out some of the things that we thought. 
Uh, so please, and of course, our knowledge of the subject is not that deep like you. You are, you are into the policy making, so please uh, correct us if we are wrong somewhere. And thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, we know that you were tired yesterday night, but thank you. So our topic, you have already been introduced. It is regarding the intro introduction of uh, European trading scheme into the aviation industry in European Union. So let's get into this topic. But before we go deep into this subject, let's uh, start with this. Um, first of all, aviation is responsible globally for 2% of the emissions, CO2 emissions in particular. It accounts for 35% of the global trade, but it is interesting to see that only 0.5% of the global volume of trade. To put this into perspective, if we compare it with maritime trade, it, is, it covers 90% of the volume and responsible only for like 40 times less than uh, this one. So the, the worth, the value of uh, in trade, it's 6.5 trillion US dollars just in 2014. And when we took, take it to the, like for traveling, for passengers, the average growth has been 6% uh, since 2010. And each year normally there are 3 billion and even more people like air bookings. It is expected to rise to 2,000 uh, in 2032 to 6.6 .6 mm. billion passenger bookings. Uh, so, and then, then this, there is a new thing, this rise of Asia and Latin America. Um, they were nearly 38% in 19, uh, uh, sorry, just to correct. Uh, the percentage of EU, the share of EU, which was uh, apparently 73% in 70s, is going to decrease and Asia and because of Latin America, their rise, uh, it will become some 38% by in 2032. So we already talked about ICAO, and it forecasts that uh, by 2050, the aviation emission could be 300 to 700% from the base level of 2005. So it is a serious issue. It is not, uh, uh, the volume is huge. Now, just entering into the design features of this uh, legislation, of this directive. It was the directive of, that was passed in, on November 19, 2008. It was an amendment to the previous directive of 2003. Uh, of 2003, and it was an amendment to include aviation into the already existing European trading scheme for emissions. Main features, it was, this scheme is non-discriminatory. And this is very important. It means, doesn't matter if the flight or if the airline is from Europe or from any other country. It is under this, uh, under this directive, under this legislation. Cap and trade, as Professor already explained. Uh, it was a cap and trade mechanism, so fixing the level of allowances in the beginning of the year, and then trading it or distributing it, whatever the situation be. And to see, there were two phases. There was phase one that was only for one year, and then there was phase two, which into VR already, 2030 until 2013 to 2020. What, were the, what are the main features? And I'm talking only about right now between 2013 and 2020, but the difference is not much. So 95% uh, was the level of allowances was at 95% of the historical emissions. And that is the average of between 2004 and 2006. Uh, so, and this, of this 95%, 82% are allocated free of, uh, like, free allocation based on 2010 emissions data of the airlines. Then, re remaining 50% will be auctioned or is auctioned by the state, by the regulators. And 3% is the reserve, what Professor was saying, uh, that this 3% is for any new entrant who enters into the market. Or maybe if some airline is growing very fast and they want to increase their share, so they can do this. But what are the options for the airlines? First, reduce your emissions. You know, means you are causing, uh, you are contributing towards a global problem. So either you reduce your emissions by 
using better technology, efficient fuels. If not, you buy it from regulators at the auctions. More options, you can buy it from other line, airlines. If they can save their uh, allowances, you can buy it from them. Or you can buy it from other installations, other industries, or some intermediaries. If not, buy it from clean development mechanisms or joint uh, uh, implement uh, impl implementation initiatives. But the amount that you can buy from clean development mechanisms or joint imp implementation initiatives, it is limited by the directive of 2000, 2009. Exceptions, there were few exceptions into this directive. What are the exceptions? First, rescue or public service obligations. Those airline, those like aircrafts that are involved into this particular things, they are not charged. They are not, they are not included into this uh, scheme. Also, airlines that have 243 flights in three consecutive four months period. Means for three four months period, if you have only 243 flights, you don't pay, you are not included. Airlines that emit less than 10,000 tons of CO2 per year, they are also excluded. It means uh, airlines who are very small, airlines that come from developing countries, they are not included into this. But finally it was launched in 2012. But there is a big but here. And Sebastian will continue further. So, yeah, as you say, the Professor Lipietz, there was a, a big problem with, uh, so Canada, uh, just can pay countries, which uh, sent this letter to complain basically about this new system implemented in, in uh, European ETC, ETS. Um, the, the global outcry was like, the, the framework is like, obviously we know that aviation industry is one of the leading industries in the globalization process, which links more and more every country and basically provides some very big question about cooperation of the, the countries. Um, the thing is, it was uh, obviously, as you said, a, a unilateral directive uh, in the sense that it was uh, launched by Europe uh, which was first, uh, which was part of the International Civil Aviation Organization, which is a, a UN body uh, responsible for the, the regulation. And the thing is, uh, we, we were wondering why, wh what was uh, the strategy behind it, in the sense that uh, since we, we were part of, I mean, Europe was part of the ECAO, and uh, obviously by launching this law, we knew that it was a unilateral law with, which would uh, raise problem uh, at the international level. So mm, on the one hand we thought maybe it was a, li uh, a leading strategy so as to uh, in the future uh, renegotiate it and further negotiation which, which came basically because in, uh, as you said uh, earlier in 2016 the process was uh, we launched again at the global level by ECAO which uh, promises to uh, take uh, to take actions uh, with uh, this uh, 2020 gap for global emission from uh, aviation industry. And so it raises a, a lot of questions about uh, how to implement uh, from an institutional point of view uh, at the global level, how to implement an institution which is suffi sufficiently binding and sufficiently powerful so as the countries uh, can work together before launching a new unilateral law. So that, that's one big issue about this uh, ECAO problem and more globally about any UN nation problem, which is the, the main problem is that it's not binding. So uh, basically it's always this uh, issue of uh, threat and, and renegotiation processes. Uh, also, yeah, we, we, were, we had integration first about the, the threats from the lobbies. Uh, obviously some airlines, uh, airlines from all over the world uh, did obviously lobbied for the against the law and as you said we, we didn't know about Airbus but uh, obviously Airbus did also because of the the threat from the Juscan countries um, coming up. Uh, so yeah the outcome so as I said uh, there was a, a fixed uh, gap for uh, 2016 so this year uh, for renegotiate the the uh, cap and trade uh, agreements in the aviation industry uh, so yeah, the idea is what it was based on, as someone said, on 
2004, 2006 means, I guess, and uh, we, we saw here the, on the graph that, so the red one is uh, if we do nothing, basically, and the blue one is that if we implement something, we could uh, raise some very beneficial results in the next 30 years uh, if, if something worked, uh, hopefully. So just to say that all these other European countries, uh, non-European airlines, they were they are excluded until 2000, 2016. So, and around 80 percent uh, of the emissions that are caused into aviation is for the flights that are more than 1,500 kilometers. So it means uh, it doesn't serve the purpose for it was meant to be. Again, so issues and questions. Here we will raise some issues which are directly or indirectly related to the subject and maybe you can better answer it. Uh, so first thing, it is regarding the trade and as you discussed before that airlines, uh, it is from your report only, that airlines uh, cause a lot of uh, problem. It is highest, it is 607 uh, grams per ton kilometer of emission compared to other modes of transport. And maritime is in fact the, is the most efficient mode of transportation. But given the volume, uh, it, produ it produces more emissions. But so we see that in this world, uh, the new, the economy that we are into with trade liberalization, that we need it for development. And yesterday we, we were at the European Commission and it was very interesting discussion related to TTIP. And they said that it is uh, important, and one of the examples was an example of oysters. <laughs> that uh, oysters, that French oysters cannot be sold in America because uh, there is a tiny difference and we need to remove those differences between two countries, so the two com com uh, communities, so that trade can prosper. But is it really important to transport, like trade oysters? They can produce oysters in the United States. And so, Things like this. There is a. <laughs> there, there, there is a. There is this non linkage between trade policy and environmental policy. And another presentation we had yesterday, they were saying that, you know, some laws are made by one group, some laws are made by other groups, so they don't concern each other. Maybe you have something more to add to it. And then there's obligations by these international agreements, which are bilateral, multilateral, or pluri plurilateral trade agreements, and they say that these are unnecessary barriers to trade. Uh, but really, th these are important for the existence of our environment, for, for a public, global public good. Then, then further problem is related to IPR issues, transfer of technology. Here again, these international agreements also hamper, trade agreements also hamper this uh, transfer of technology to developing countries. Then ambiguous definition of environmental goods. The in WTO says, okay, if it is environmental good, you can make some exceptions. But what is an environmental good? This is uh, different countries have different problems regarding the definition. As such, if there could be, a, there can be a subsidy for an environmental good, but it is very difficult to define which is a green good. So you cannot raise or raise tariffs or give subs, uh, subsidies to them. So yeah, the, the, the more broad uh, issue with uh, this uh, aviation problem and the, uh, the ETS problem uh, actually is that the, the framework of uh, Kyoto Protocol is, uh, as you said, based on the producer, uh, is a producer-based uh, cap and trade system, uh, which was the link to what you said is that uh, we, we have to somehow uh, reach uh, a footprint, a footprint uh, framework in the near future if we want to uh, assess the, the topic more finally. And uh, so, yeah, th this was the big interrogation we had, like, uh, how can we implement an institution and renegotiate uh, to somehow uh, get to this uh, new consumer-based uh, cap-and-trace system, which, which would assess the problem much more efficiently, since uh, obviously there is a carbon leakage problem, which is uh, in the fact, the actual calculus uh, based on producers, for example, the uh, United States are uh, with the current calculus supposed to have uh, lowered their emission, uh, their CO2 emissions, which is in fact completely false since 
many, many uh, uh, goods con consumed in the, in the United States were produced in China and India. And some studies uh, show that if you take into account all those productions, uh, actually it, it was from between 10 and 15 percent, I guess, uh, of uh, CO2 emission for the United States. Um, there is also the um, yeah the, the 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 issue with the standardization uh, problem. There is on the one hand the processes through the WTO action, which is we have to standardize since we have to. Uh, basically, uh, all played on this level playing fields, and on the other end, to yeah, to climate level, uh, the many goods uh, for which countries do not have the same uh, perception, basically. So, what is your your stake on that? And um, yeah, the, the uh, further issue was: can EU take a unilateral stance on the climate leveling uh, issues also? Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, more about the context now. Uh, we know that, uh, as uh, it has been shown in the in the media recently, there is uh, this uh, oil prices uh, fall uh, really recently. It's about 35 euros a barrel, I guess, today. And and uh, for example, Saudi Arabia put it uh, at 26 dollar a barrel for the 2016 budgets. And most of the forecasting are showed that. Uh, for the next two decades, probably oil prices will be uh, very low because of the demand and uh, supply context of the world. So wh what are your stakes on this oil price fi failing in the fact that for the fight against climate change as a global uh, issue, uh, we'll have obviously huge incentives not to substitute any, uh, any new, new uh, kind of energy uh, to oil since it, it will be really cheap. Uh, there will be also the lower effects of taxation since, for example, uh, we could uh, suggest that the airline companies, even in the fact that in the case that there is this uh, cap and trade system, could uh, keep their margin just by, uh, you know, uh, gain, gain a lot of cost product on, uh, on oil, uh, oil prices. And so, the, yeah, the main issue is uh, how, how will it impact negotiations and quest for long-term solutions uh, according to you? And yeah, they did. There are also these issues of carbon prices who went down during the crisis because of the lowering of, of the activity. And uh, yeah, and uh, we, we saw also that the CDM and the uh, JI pro project were quite not efficient uh, since uh, I think it was between 2013 and 2014, there was 70% decrease of CDM projects. And almost maybe zero, z zero for JI projects. So, uh, how can we deal with uh, this, this, uh, this kind of projects, basically? Okay. So, going, uh, so going beyond. There is this thing that we know. We all we are doing by. Uh, all the regulations that we are putting into place or we are trying to put is buying some time it is this is at the end of at the end of the day this is it at one day it is going to come we have already crossed in 2015 was the hottest year and we already crossed this one degree celsius barrier that we had and initially before two degrees celsius it was one degree celsius so there are things we know we know there are things we know we don't know and there are things we don't know we don't know uh, so where we are here, we, we know that uh, one, we have already crossed this one degree Celsius mark and soon this two degree Celsius mark, we already have studies that say that there is no way we are going to cross it. The, this is done. So isn't now time for EU and other international community to think what we are going to do like when it happens, the measures to take or better be prepared for it whenever it comes. Yeah, and uh, on an even more broader perspective, the, uh, we had uh, two months ago a seminar about uh, the, um, the framework of rights of nature against uh, monetized and market-based instruments uh, issues. So yeah, the, the, the whole uh, framework we just talked about is uh, about basically monetizing and give the uh, market value to nature, which raises a lot of question about the, the danger of uh, in which end does will we, we lie all those assets in the near future. And uh, for example, the, the there is this uh, uh, red issue, uh, 
reducing emission from deforestation, which has been a huge issue because it, it, it went basically against uh, a, a lot of uh, indigenous uh, people. It destroyed forests because the benchmark was badly designed and that kind of problem. So maybe on more broader issue, uh, what would be, aside from economic perspective, the legal, maybe judicial, uh, judicial issues, like could we implement a, uh, a tribunal for nature in the world? And uh, how could we, uh, as a culturally and philosophically, assess the question of maybe we should give rights to nature on itself and not through the market process? So I would also like to know what's your, your opinion about the, those debates. That's it. Thank you very much. <coughs> well, 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 very good uh, comments. Uh, there are a lot of questions, some of them on the, on the issue and many of them uh, on more broader problems of uh, geopolitics, ethics, tactics, etc., etc. <laughs> uh, first thing, what was the strategy behind the attempt of 2007? Uh, the strategy was, uh, well, I am partly in, uh, accountable for this mistake because I, I said they will not dare, and they did dare. So I said they will not make a war for that and they make a commercial war for that. Uh, my strategy, and the strategy which was accepted by the Parliament, the Commission, and the EU, the, the Council, was to say we are not attacking directly the uh, the ICAO regulation. We are just talking of the airports. The permits are the right to land on in, a, in an airport. It is not what you do in, <laughs> in the airs. Of course, it is nearly like, like taxing the kerosene in the airport. But it was a lo local measure. It was an inner EC measure, EU measure. Uh, and, and I think I have to correct you. I'm not sure, but uh, as far as I read, at least in the French government uh, um, communication about the stop the clock uh, regulation, it's not that the uh, other firms, third party firms of aviation, are excluded from the implementation of, uh, of a law. It's only that the other airports, third party airports, are excluded. That is, you, we implement the uh, introduction of, the, of aviation in the ATS between two airports of EU. Normally, what we decided in 2007 is that any airplane arriving from China or from United States going to Frankfurt, or Paris, say for instance, or Frankfurt, has to pay something and also leaving anywhere. Okay? And now the stop the clock is, in that case, no. It's only for these ones. Why? It is very important. Because you cannot implement it inside and pretend that Europe is still an even playing field. Because some years ago, it's another story, the cabotage right was introduced. Before it was not. Uh, before, uh, say, uh, United Airlines or TWA has not the right to go into Paris, stop in Paris, and take passengers to Frankfurt or Berlin. That is cabotage. Cabotage is when you are in an international line, but you go, uh, cabotage is a mari maritime uh, term. Uh, you go to Saint-Nazaire uh, in France, but after Saint-Nazaire, you go to Rochefort, Oléron, etc. Huh? And it's <laughs> you are used as a local transporter why, in fact, you are an international transporter. And you try to take the advantage of the international law uh, to be excluded from the internal laws. So the problem of cabotage is more, more important. Before it was forbidden, 
TWA or United Airlines arrive in uh, Paris and take no passenger for Frankfurt. Now it can. Uh, I think it's the same everywhere because uh, when I was young, I, went, uh, I was a uh, young uh, economist. I used to go to, say, Sao Paulo. And uh, of course, if you stop first in Rio de Janeiro, nobody could climb into the plane to go then uh, to uh, Rio. Now it's, now it's possible or to, between Sao Paulo and uh, Rio. Um, so well, while, whereas, sorry, whereas there is possibility of capotage, you are obliged to treat all the firms the same way. The only difference is with uh, what was voted in 2007 is that you cannot implement the, the, the directive for plane coming from outside the European space. So our, our, our strategy was clearly that we are pretending that it, is all, it was not against ICAO. It was only <laughs> a measure about our own effort. That was our argument. Second, um, but it, what was the argument against the ICAO? Now, at the inner level, I gave you all my arguments. But there was another one, which was the front runner argument. The front runner argument is extremely important. It was a position of EU during, uh, from 1992 to 2008, where uh, EU abandoned the leadership in the fight against uh, uh, climate change. That was the argument of the front runner. The front runner argument is an argument of economics or theory of, of games, who says that, which says that uh, if we believe that some regulation will be a commitment for everybody in, within 20 years, the first one which implements it for itself takes a competitive advantage in front of all the others. That is why EU was the leader in the quarter of the world in front of, in, in terms of doing something against climate change. In, uh, I had, uh, I was a reporter for uh, United uh, UNESCO during the Rio conference about the, the, the negotiation of Rio conference, which was involving biodiversity, uh, desertific desertification, uh, bio uh, and climate change. And uh, uh, one of the researchers I was coordinating as the writer of the concluding uh, report, uh, I made a, um, a very funny table about who were the countries which were more able to compete within a world where there would be a regulation against climate change. That is, what are the countries where the quantity of carbon dioxide by dollar or euro produced, there was no euro, by dollar produced, huh? that is, what are the countries which are more in advance who have a greater competitive advantage if there is a regulation against climate change. And there was a perfect coincidence between this map, this, this map the map I'm talking of, uh, what are the countries who, are, who take a competitive advantage from a regulation because they are very efficient, the, the map of the competitive advantage and the map of positions. Not this one. These one are different. These are victims, pure victims. Uh, these one are both victims and culprits. These are mainly pure uh, culprits. And this one too. Huh? Uh, that leads me uh, to adaptation or mitigation. The debate mitigation adaptation is, for me, it's, uh, I agree with you. We are going much above two degrees, much above. And the great difference is that uh, Venice and Amsterdam, all Holland, is protecting itself against the sea level, but Bangladesh has absolutely no, no capacity to do it. One third of Bangladesh, in my opinion, is already condemned. It will be invaded by water, it will, uh, and all uh, tens of millions of 
people who have to move to India and see the relation between India and Bangladesh. That will not be a very, very, very uh, easy uh, way. Uh, I'm not uh, accusing India. I see the way uh, Europe is uh, um, welcoming uh, Syrians uh, refugees. And uh, I know exactly the, the problem that, that will arise uh, from the flood of Bangladesh. Uh, we as Green, we tried during uh, tens of years uh, to, to avoid posing the problem of adaptation to climate change, but now uh, the main problem is adaptation, which, is, which does not mean that we have to abandon the fight for mitigation. Because it's completely different to have two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, or five degrees uh, of difference. So I think we have to adapt to a three degrees and try to battle against uh, four, five, six, pretending it is battling for two degrees, but it will not be two degrees. I don't believe, except if there is a war and blah, blah, blah. The war is important. Uh, the war, uh, big crises are very important. As you say, uh, 2008 made a fantastic break. First of all, there was a compromise of, between Merkel and Sarkozy to abandon the objectives of EU. EU, when I, I, in 2007, the objective of EU was minus 40% by comparison to 1990, but Copenhagen, uh, goals of EU was minus 40 percent. No, sorry, minus 40 percent by uh, um, 2025, if there is an agreement at the international level, and minus 30 if there is no. That is the argument of a front runner. Uh, uh, in 2008, in December, Merkel and Sarkozy decided it will be. Minus 20. Minus 20 in 2020, which is much insufficient, completely insufficient. And was really abandoning the leadership to the rest of the world, who want to be the fighter for. Uh, of course, uh, there, is a big, there was a big crisis. So it was very easy to, to make minus 20 percent because of a recession. You have nothing to do to, to get minus 20%. Just the usual uh, business as usual fact that all firms try to spend less money in raw materials or energy. There is a spontaneous technical improvement every year due to strictly microeconomic, microeconomic uh, consideration by the firms. So minus 20% is nothing. That's the reason why the price of carbon fall. Because this, the allowance was just business as usual, as usual, and there was a depression. In a situation of depression, if you don't make a very strong reduction of the allowance every new year, then the price of carbon falls to zero. So I, I, I insist. On that point, the problem with cap and trade is cap. It is not trade. I see a lot of uh, alter globalists who are against trade. I think the, allo the alloca reallocation of the, you know, the second market of the allowances is very useful. But the problem is not there. The problem is the political wish to reduce the emission is realized immediately by cap. If you put a tax, it's just a problem of neoclassical uh, arbitrage between price and quantity. You don't know exactly what will be the effect. If you put a cap, you know what will be the effect. It's a cap. Then you have a problem of implementation. But you have problems of implementation everywhere. You cannot control. You can control. Some people say, uh, uh, it is difficult to control the, the, the tax. Some people say it's difficult to control the quantity. Both are difficult to control. You can throw it everywhere. You are not, you are not obliged to choose. You should not be induced for one technique, transferable permits or tax, just because of the fraud. The practical way to control as I told you, it's a 
There is a very important paper by Godard, Olivier Godard. You can look at that, Olivier Godard. Olivier Godard explained that, as I told you, when you have, for individuals, it is stupid to put a cap and, tra cap and trade system because you cannot cap individuals, cannot control individuals. So for individuals, you put a tax. Each time you go to buy some petrol, you pay a tax, that's all. Uh, if you are uh, big, big, big uh, uh, emitter of uh, greenhouse gas, then a cap and trade system is much more efficient, much more efficient. And the idea that the aspect of trade, after the cap you have a trade, was introduced by a Nobel Prize, alternative Nobel Prize, Anil Agarwal, during the, he got the alternative Nobel Prize. Anil Agarwal was famous because uh, he introduced during the 92, 1992 negotiation a terrible, a dramatic critique, devastatory critique against the idea of grandfathering. At the time, the United States say, okay, there is a problem with, um, suppose, no, they did not admit it, suppose there's really a problem with climate change. Uh, then, let us reduce all the GDP, the, the right of emission of all the countries in proportion. United States makes uh, minus 5%, India makes five, minus 5%. And Anil Aguaral made a paper say, called uh, uh, Ecological Colonialism. Of course, this grandfathering means the difference between North and South is for eternity. And it is <laughs> plugged in <laughs> for regulation. Huh? The more you were polluting during the Industrial Revolution in the 19th and 20th century, the more you have right on the 21st century until the end of the times. Uh, and he said, no, we have to cap any country according to its population, and then you can trade. That is, Bangladesh, which is much under its own cap, can sell its right to the United States, get the money, and have the right to increase its pollution, its contribution to contamination, but is induced not to do so by the fact it can sell it. So all you have advantage every side. Cap and trade is the best friend of ecology and uh, uh, repartition, resharing uh, of the burden. Uh, in favor of the poorest countries. The problem is that, of course, if the rich has a right to control and the poor has not a possibility, the capacity to control, the fraud will be enormous in favor of the rich. That's a usual problem. As uh, Lamonet said, uh, uh, when there is no regulation at all, it is like the free fox uh, in the free, uh, within uh, the free, uh, the, the poulailler um, hunt uh, house, uh, chicken house, the, the free fox uh, within the, the free chickens. Huh? Uh, uh, but if you put a regulation and the fox is uh, still the money uh, to control the implementation of a regulation, of course, the chickens are not protected, clearly. Uh, so these are the kinds of problems. Really, I do think, like Anil Agarwal, that cap and trade is the best system. Uh, now, uh, debate on the possibility to implement within the BTP, WTO. You, you, you speak of bilateral. It's multilateral. Bilateral is the... Um, multilateral is everybody is involved. Bilateral is an agreement between USA and uh, Colombia. Uh, after the breakdown uh, of uh, WTO, which occurred in uh, 2008, 2010, WTO dis nearly disappeared. So today, there is a bi uh, bilateral uh, rebirth of bilateral negotiation. United States say to a group of countries, sm of smaller countries, we have a, an agreement about uh, free trade. My position, uh, when I was a uh, president of a delegation of Europe for 
the uh, camp in the Andean community was to defend by regional, by regionalism. That is, big power negotiate with a group of sovereign country. But the power of bilateral negotiation was enormous. But by, it is not at all. Bilateral is completely different. Huh? Which one? Uh, it's a multilateral. It's a multilateral. Yeah. It's, it's no, it's a bi-regional in the case of the uh, Atlantic uh, Treaty. No, it's, it's a bi-regional. Bi-regional. Yeah. Bi it's only, the only thing that remains is bilateral and bi-regional. You have a choice, to choose. I am again, it's bilateral because in general it's a very powerful country in front of a very small country. Bi-regional, you can negotiate. Bilateral, the bigger win. Takes all. Uh, now, uh, well, we are, I'm not going to discuss PPM. Uh, I discussed this already. Uh, the example of uh, harmonic bread uh, veals uh, is uh, really the typical baton. Do we consider that a veal uh, which is transformed by, or, or even also the transgenic plants is the same? Are the transgenic plants the same plant? Most people do not consider it's true. It's different. Uh, but it is not written in the WTO. Uh, climate labeling. Climate labeling is a form of introducing PPM in a soft way. That is, you do not say, I prohibit uh, the importation of this kind of product from China because it is not uh, environmental uh, friend, environmentally friend. But I tell the producer, the consumer, that it is not. Of course, we fostered the green, fostered that in the European Parliament. I make a novel about that, a silly novel, where China, it's not exactly where, you will see the novel if you wish, called uh, Les Fantômes de l'Internet, where China seems to export uh, sex toys, which are a bit special in order to provoke a crisis between China and the EU. Because we had exactly in 2007 a battle with China about the toys. Toys coming from China are of very bad quality. So there was a push for protectionism against the toys. These toys were coming from China. Uh, it was a battle <laughs> where we combined prohibition and, 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 and information of the audience. Uh, of a consumer. But clearly, climate labeling is a form of introducing PPM in a soft way. You are not obliged, but we can tell you that. Since we have at least the capacity to regulate some installation in Europe, uh, we can prohibit installations which are not in agreement with our own regulation. Thus, we prohibit regulation. But it's always difficult. For instance, I mean, this is really the problem of the, I don't know if you know the tuna, tuna delphin debate. It was a great debate uh, in ecology uh, and in uh, international right. Um, uh, do you have a right to use a net to take uh, tuna that will kill delphins? Uh, of course, if you make a prohibition of these nets, you have to prohibit the importation of tuna which were caught by these nets. If not, it doesn't work. It's the same for ivory of elephants. Huh? You prohibit the ivory trade because you prohibit the killing of uh, elephants. This is PPM, typically. It is PPM, typically. Because you have a right to make a trade of all ivory. You have not the right to trade ivory which comes from a recently killed elephant. This is PPM. So PPM is introduced slowly. Uh, labeling is a way to foster the PPM strategy. Uh, now, uh, carbon price and oil, uh, oil price. Well, I, I told you it fall with a, a recession. So does it, is it a good situation? Yes, of course. It's both bad and good. It is bad because it induces all the tax, because there is tax. Uh, in France, we introduced carbon tax um, last year. 
to increase the price of oil and gas. But of course, the tax was, is much lower that we introduced this year. It's something like a one uh, uh, cent of uh, euro uh, this year, or two cents, I don't remember. Why the price of gas at the pump is uh, falling by uh, 10, 20, 30 cents due to the fall of crude, uh, uh, of the price of crude uh, petrol. My position is that, of course, it's, <laughs> it is re it's inducing people to drive too much. Huh? Uh, and so we have to, to, to use the first civic sense argument. Please don't use your car. Now it is nearly free. Don't use your car. Huh? Uh, but at the same time, it could be a good opportunity to introduce higher tax without diminishing the capacity of people to go to their uh, place of work. So it's ambiguous. Now, the rights of nature, culture, etc. Here we come to the civic sense argument. It's very important very important. The fact of introducing uh, a body for judgment against crimes against the environment is a very good idea, I foster it, but once again, there is no possibility to uh, punish a state. It doesn't exist. You can punish a state in Europe because the states, the nation states, are less and less sovereign state. There is a huge delegation of power to a higher state body, which is EU. Then you can, uh, EU can say to a country, I charge you with uh, a punishment if you don't do this or that. Yes, thank you. Uh, when you do that at international level, there is nothing of the kind. There is only the regulation of a council uh, uh, of security of uh, United Nations, but you are not going to, 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 to send bombs on a country that is polluting too much. It would be absolutely stupid. What exists is the fact that once a country is committed to do something, the NGOs and the civil society can go into the justice of the same country and say, this government is not doing what it is obliged to do. Uh, last point. Incertitude. Uh, all the debate with uh, climato-skepticism. Uh, what to say? Uh, today, I think, there is no more room for scientific skepticism on the fact that this is true. I mean, uh, it is not from uh, 2000, uh, no, sorry. 18,020 something by Fourier. Fourier gave the explanation of why the planet is not cold. <laughs> uh, it was this. And uh, then Arrhenius at the end of the century said, this is the list of the gas we are producing that effect. And it explained now by quantum dynamics, if you don't believe in greenhouse effect, you don't believe in television. You don't believe in uh, nothing which depends on uh, the interaction between matter and, and the light. Uh, it's, it's just quantum mechanics. And uh, so, but what we don't know exactly are, is what are the countervailing effects or uh, multiplier effects. So, if you increase by 6% uh, uh, CO2, for instance, uh, will be, uh, what will be the move of the temperature on the Earth and what will be the local, the local move of the temperature on the Earth, you don't know. And it is a good thing. It is a good thing. And I've finished with that. In 92, our nightmare was, would have been, the capacity of a computer to say uh, the greenhouse effect is good for that country and bad for that country because it would have been absolutely impossible to induce a country for which it was a good effect to participate to the mitigating uh, bargain, uh, sorry, burden to fight against climate change. This is what we call the veil of ignorance. You know, uh, 
Euh, il vous dit du tout, il vous dit ça, non The veil of ignorance, you know, the theory of justice. In the official theory of justice, uh, you imagine that there is a gathering of all humankind to decide the law of humankind. And it's very important for the negotiator not to know what will be the effect of the laws in their peculiar case, their particular case. That is the principle of the veil of ignorance. Huh? And then there will be all the Parisian and Rawls uh, uh, theory of justice that can develop. But it's very important not to know exactly is it a good thing or a bad thing. For instance, Morocco, uh, Morocco, the models today are not able to say if with a hotter atmosphere it will rain more or less in Morocco. Fantastic. So Morocco could be <laughs> interested in taking measure whatever be the situation. A big problem between 1902 and Kyoto was that Russia thought that it was a good thing for Russia to increase the temperature in Russia. Because, of course, the, the weed, etc., will be better, etc. And it was a position from 1920. The guy who invented ecology, global ecology, uh, Vodrevsky, was a great uh, specialist of agriculture in Russia in 1920. And he always, say, he already says after the First World War, ah, it's fantastic. With the car, cars will develop, and then there will be more greenhouse effect, and it will be fantastic for the agriculture of Russia and in, in Soviet Union. So Soviet Union was extremely in favor of greenhouse effect. And then what happened? You know, uh, the permafrost. Uh, you call it, what is permafrost in English? That is the freeze land of Siberia started to shake <laughs> because they were melting and all the cities in Siberia are now <laughs> uh, beginning to, to, to move <laughs> because uh, the, the, the heating of Siberia is transforming the soil. And so uh, Russia realized it was not at all a good thing for Russia to have a greenhouse effect. So the veil of ignorance is very important and uh, thank you for that ignorance but we, we are sure it will be bad. We are sure uh, because some country will be invaded by water and some country will see their culture, their agriculture disappear, simply disappear. The one which are just, for instance, Algeria, suppose that the, the climate line will be driven 500 kilometers to the north, all the agriculture of Algeria disappears. That's all. So it will be terrible, but we don't know exactly where and how much. And it's a good thing. Thank you. So we only have uh, something like 40 minutes. And that's yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, thank you for these answers. Uh, then we'll make some groups of three or four questions, and you will answer. And, uh, okay, so if you have some question, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. You have one? Okay. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Sofia. I have a question about the interactions between European Union and America about the environmental issues. And in one of the previous presentations, I don't remember the details, but we were told that um, th there had to be one uh, contract between America and U European Union about the pollution by the companies. And um, America wanted to uh, allow the companies to pay one time for the pollution and allow them to pollute. And European Union was on the side of the taxation on the companies that pollute. And in the end it happened that European Union agreed with America and it allowed companies to buy the right to pollute. And in the end the American America didn't sign this contract and the situation emerged when um, on the territory of Europe, it was able to buy the right to pollute and on the territory of America not. So the American companies could basically go to Europe, buy the right to pollute and pollute as much as they want. Um, if I'm not mistaken, could you please give any comments on this situation and how the European Union plan or 
can change it in favor to environmental protection. Thank you. You're, you're speaking of what happened in 92 and sometime after until Kyoto. <coughs> it's difficult because the debate was there, carried on in a very ideologic way and not in a very scientific way. The first line, there are several lines of defense of the United States. The United States was basically in favor of doing nothing. Nordhaus and some others. No, that it's yes. No, that and some others said there is no problem with United States and or North America and global heating because all the continent is based on an organization of agriculture. This is Mexico, USA, and Canada, made by a cotton belt, a corn belt, a wheat belt. Suppose more or less two degrees of increase of temperature, uh, centigrade degrees of increase in temperature means 500 kilometers move of this belt to the north. We are in a free trade agreement there. All our belts are still available. Look, it is not a, so it is not a problem with the forest. That was the North House argument in 1920, in 1991. So USA was basically okay, for doing nothing. Now, of course, the reputation effect is very important in politics and in economics. So it's very difficult for a country trying to keep a leadership, a world leadership, to say, I don't care. You can die, I don't care. Uh, so they had the second line of argument saying, we could do something, but we are in favor of market and not administrative. So it introduced this debate, transferable permit against tax. Transferable permit was a judoka form for Europe to say, oh, you, you don't like law, you prefer market. We have that, cap and trade. As I told you, according to Anila Garwal, cap and trade is much better. Anyway, because you cannot tax everybody, and there will be avoiding tax, etc. So, so United States accepted first, within the negotiation, to sign a trade and cap system in Kyoto. But then the negotiator come back to the United States and uh, the Senate and the uh, House of Representatives said no. So I think uh, basically uh, United States after that, well, as soon as 92 in fact, said, OK, we are ready to do something if this one do something. So from 92, to later, to the COP21, China and, and India and Juscan began to form alliance. They said, we are not, not going not to do anything until this one move. And this one said, look, I am not a Jesuit, I am nearly quoting uh, Mohaiti, it was a dictator of Malaysia in 1992. The North had the right to kill indigenous people, to uh, burn its forests, to burn all its carbon, coal. Uh, we have the right, during 150 years, to kill our indigenous people, to, uh, uh, to, to, to burn our forests, and to burn our coal. So there was a kind of uh, catch-22 or uh, uh, system of... Um, uh, you know, like in chess game, you, you are, you are pet. Huh? The king cannot take the king, and etc. Huh? That was the situation until, until this COP21. But today, uh, I think the system is cap and trade. 
there will be no international tax. I don't think so. It is cap and trade, either we accept or not. As a result, if there is a cap for some countries and no cap in other countries, there should be some form of border tax adjustment between the two. And this is a problem of the uh, UNCC uh, Treaty of Kyoto, that it was putting a market of quota between countries where there was no capping. A market of quota can exist only when there is a cap. That is a problem. Yeah, another question. We'll take the two questions. Maybe. Hi. Um, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I would like to take advantage of your... Um, yeah, my name is Erika. <laughs> um, I, I, I just have a curiosity. Um, to, to your knowledge, right now, and especially um, since the beginning of the Juncker Commission, is there any liaison, any um, cooperation between the Department of uh, Environmental Policies and that of Migration Policies? And the reason of my concern is that there are several studies who are forecasting a new uh, emergency, which is going to happen in the next decades, and that is uh, the one of uh, environmental refugees. So. I would like to understand whether this issue is addressed at all uh, on a European level, and if so, on what extent. That's, thanks. Hi, Jay Christopher. Um, I have two questions. Uh, so you've been talking about the difference between the carbon tax and the cap and trade system. And it seems like you haven't talked a whole lot about the, the fact that the tax would also raise money. Um, as opposed to the cap and trade, which just sets the cap. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, particularly for Europe in a time when public debts have become such a massive political problem. Um, because if coming from the United States, it seems like the cap and trade was always the conservative uh, idea. That was that was the um, that was the compromise point in the middle that liberals really want a really want a carbon tax, but we're willing to settle for a cap and trade. So I was just wondering if you could kind of talk about the the how that falls on the political spectrum. Uh, and then the second question was you, you've talked to quite a bit about how these international agreements can be enforced in local courts or in, in um in national courts as far as COP21 is not binding, but if you're in the Netherlands and you don't think your country is enforcing that, you can take it to the court there and try to get something done. Um, I was wondering how you see that playing out in the United States, because that seems very, very unlikely that any American court or the Supreme Court would uphold an international agreement over domestic law. Well, uh, I will start with the last question because uh, it's the, most, it's the most basic. We have two traditions in the world, I mean, in the, in, the, in the modern world, which is the European continental and the British one. Uh, one is um, civil law, and the other is continent, uh, pardon, common law. United States, like Great Britain, Malta, and Cyprus, so we're only three countries in, in Europe, uh, is common law. Most of our countries in Europe, or all the other countries in Europe, and most of the countries in the world are civil law system. A common law is that there is only two actors possible, the complainer and the, <laughs> and the <laughs> charge, and there is one justice. Um, the, uh, what we call the civil law system is that there are two systems of law, one for the states and one for the individuals or the firms, what we call civil society. In France, and most Europe, all the continental Europe is under the civil law regime, and Great Britain, Cyprus, and uh, Malta are under the common law uh, problem. I was in charge of uh, the um, regulation directive 
No, it was directive. Um, about, as I told you, uh, the, civil response, the civil responsibility uh, in case of environment uh, damage. That is, how much has a private individual to pay to another individual if the individual B says that it has been damaged by, the, environmentally damaged by the firm A, okay? And I, I organized a discussion with the EPA. The EPA is the Ministry of uh, uh, Environment in the United States. Because clearly, all the problems stem from the fact that we had in Europe two different traditions. One is on the continent, the civil law, and in Great Britain, Malta, and uh, uh, in the islands, basically, uh, uh, the civil law system. No, sorry, the common law system. So I asked for the biggest common law system country, that is United States, to explain to us how it worked. He said, for his ministry, two thirds, two thirds of his budget was not to defend national parks, etc., etc., was for advocates. For advocates. That is, anybody could go to United States, to a judge in United States, and say, tobacco industry has caused to me a cancer, and the government did nothing. So you attack them both at the same time in front of the same court. And once it is won, it costs billions of dollars. And when we discussed in 1902, uh, at the time, in, I guess in 92, uh, we were preparing in France the, uh, the negotiation of Rio. I was not, uh, the Green had not won any big election, but we were starting to win more and more elections. So I was, uh, because I am a high civil servant in another life, uh, I was invited to, to, the negotiate, to the group of negotiators, and one negotiator said, well, United States, they stopped smoking in 10 years. Once the, the tobacco industry lost his, uh, his trial, and it will be exactly the same. It will, exactly, it will be exactly the same. We thought that the civic science will win after the, uh, what was the name of uh, this uh, typhoon on New Orleans, Erika? No, um, Katrina, 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 typhoon destroy the city of New Orleans. So everybody, everything, everywhere in Europe says, ha ha, now they are going to sign something against climate change. Not at all. They managed to pretend that the image uh, of a tempest was exactly the image of an uh, embryon in the belly of uh, a mother, and it was a punishment of God against abortion. So, uh, 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 okay, we lose. Uh, but we don't, we, are, we really believe that someday, within five years or ten years, some coalition of NGOs will attack the US government for non implementing what it signed in, 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 uh, uh, in Paris. That's the reason why there was the stop. You remember the Saturday? Uh, it should finish on Friday evening. But it went into Saturday at 5 o'clock. Because there was a meeting in one spelling where there was a word uh, could or uh, should, no, shall, instead of should. And of course, for the United States, it was terrific. Because if it says should instead of shall instead of should, uh, this induced the Congress to have the hand of, of the negotiation. So, by maintaining should, it is only a soft law. That is, it is not constraining. At the international level, it's not constraining even at the national level. Just as for smoking, there is nowhere, nowhere written that United States shall prohibit smoking in the street. It's, there is no uh, uh, law saying that. It was never voted. But once a judge say, okay, we promote the concern, so 
500 billion dollars for each company, of course, it changed everything. And that will happen, I think. Uh, now, uh, so you, you have to understand how to fight when you are in, a, in another country where there is a soft regulation adopted by your country, which you have to, you as a, an activist or an economist, etc., to fight for in your own country. Depends of if it is civil right, civil law, or um, common law. Second, the question on the tax. Sorry, the uh, tax. The cap is free. That is a great battle, precisely. Huh? When uh, uh, we voted in 2007, that 25% of the allowance will be distributed by auction. Now it is how much you said? I think today it is 15% by auction. Huh? So we voted for 25 and we got 15 after the crisis. Uh, after the crisis, <laughs> we got only 15. So only 15% of the allowance are paid by to, to the state, to the state, uh, by uh, the, um, the firms to get their permits. The rest, they can buy it, they can get them freely, and can the, or they can buy them in the second uh, market. Uh, what is the difference? Here you have to explain. What, what do you want to do? Do you think uh, regulation for environmental issue is in order to protect the planet, or is it to pay to to create a new font of money for the government? This is the, this is the debate. Uh, it's called the double dividend problem. A tax has a double dividend problem. Uh, uh, has a double dividend. That is, it is a good effect on environment, and it has a good effect on the fi public finances, because you tax. Of course, the aspect tax is uh, you are not going to kill what you are taxing. So the, the problem of t using your tax for the finance of the government means I hope they will not stop polluting, huh? because I need their money. Uh, so it's very dangerous to use a tax when you uh, use uh, pollutax or ecotax in order to reduce the pollution. Some time you, there is no problem. I made a paper on that if you are interested on the, the eco, eco politic, the politics of ecotax. An ecotax could be in order to avoid a pollution, give money to a country, uh, finance the mitigation, you can use the tax to finance the mitigation of the pollution, or the adaptation to the pollution, or the reparation of nature. Huh? There are several ways. You have to combine all that. Normally, CAP is much better because you separate the function of fighting for against pollution and the function of financing the, gov the, the, the government. It's exactly the same problem of taxing prostitution. Uh, if the government tax prostitution, it could be accused by feminists of being a proxenet, huh? a Mac. Uh, yeah, the, the, the interest of the government is the more there is prostitution, there is more, the more money is accruing to the government. Uh, taxing uh, the production of, uh, uh, of drugs huh? uh, is a problem of taxing what you don't like. If you use a tax to kill what you don't like, you cannot rely on it to finance the government, so cap is a much better system, or prohibition, if you will. Then, <coughs> uh, environmental refugees. There is not exactly today environmental refugees. There are hunger refugees, or violence refugees. I do believe that refugees, hunger, refugees or violence refugees are more and more stemming from environment problems. Even in 92, it was a Gengis Khan uh, argument. Huh? We have all the vocabulary of, uh, if you are involved sometime in your career in the negotiation about environment treaties, uh, you have to know some of that. The, uh, I told you of the, um, my, <coughs> my starving children agreement uh, argument. When the <coughs> 
<coughs> when Saudi Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia says, I can't do that because my children are too poor, I cannot pay. Uh, uh, this is what my, ch my Saudi children ag argument. The Genghis Khan argument is, uh, if you don't, if you European don't, uh, make this regulation on this measure in favor of the South, you will have refugees, you will have uh, immigration, you will have uh, drugs, uh, um, importation, etc., etc. Uh, so the Genghis Khan argument was, uh, well, it's false for Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan was living in a rich country, very much developed, and uh, he moved to China, not to Europe, uh, when uh, the at the beginning of a small winter, uh, a small winter uh, area, a small ice uh, age uh, period of the um, 14th century, so 15th century, 14th and 15th century. But in reality, the real movement are in front of flood, and there was already a negotiation between uh, some small islands of uh, uh, Indian Ocean and New Zealand. It was very difficult. New Zealand hardly accepted someone. It was some, some, some island which, which has for only two or three thousand people. But uh, it will be a problem for Bangladesh, I told you. And there will be a huge problem between India and Bangladesh. And who is, uh, there will be a, a problem of burden sharing of the refugees. Uh, we have a burden sharing of, uh, of Syrian refugees, of uh, Ethiopian refugees or uh, South Southern uh, Sudan refugees today in Europe. Oh, none of them is clearly uh, environmental refugee. Most of them are violence refugee and refugees. And if you look at the Arab Revolution uh, of uh, 2011, uh, 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 it was clearly a hunger. The, 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 the thought was a hunger uh, problem. Like 1848, like 1789, all the big revolution periods were a cycle of hunger uh, periods. Uh, even 1917, there was a 1917, but most clearly 1848, that is the, the European revolution, which is more similar to Arabic revolution. Uh, was due to a very hard period uh, of starving uh, because uh, of uh, bad recalls, etc. It was exactly the solution in the Arabic world, in southern uh, Sudan, in Ethiopia, etc., etc. But the mediation are enormous. You have to have a democratic demonstration, a, ter a state terrorist reaction. Uh, uh, as a result, uh, an exodus of people. And the connection with climate change is very weak. We cannot prove this is because of climate change, that there is a Syrian civil war, etc., etc. You can say, no, it's a normal reaction of people against dictatorship, and this is the normal reaction of dictatorship against people. Uh, there is nothing to do with the environment. So it's e extremely difficult to prove that. Yet, the Genghis Khan argument is present in all the debate at the European Parliament uh, since 1992. And this is the main, one of the two main reasons for the attitude of EU. EU considers, at the contrary of JESCAN, JESCAN are, you can see that all the JESCAN are islands except the United States. But it's very easy for the United States to control its boundary with Mexico. Not very, but rather easy. Look at EU. Is a, there is much more boundary in EU than there, there is territory in the EU. Uh, it's made of boundary, uh, ex external boundary. So it's very. EU was extremely pushed to do something because of its boundary problem and the Genghis Khan argument. While at the same time, Europe had the technology to accept a world regulation. So EU had a very uh, typical policy of EU is to say, one, I am universalist. Two, I take into account my interest. Three, since I'm a universalist, 
I make a, a huge legislation which is implementable, uh, implementable to all the world. Uh, three, I know, four, I know that the South cannot implement that legislation. Five, since I'm good and generous, I pay for the implementation of that legislation in the South. Uh, typically, for instance, uh, uh, the fish, for instance, fishery. Europe has a lot of regulation against excess in fishery. So Europe has a lot of legislation saying there is quota of fishery, there are uh, ways of fishing uh, big fish and not small fish, etc., etc. And then Europe says, oh, it's terrible for uh, Angola, it's terrible for Mozambique, etc. And then we will pay for Mozambique and Angola to adapt to this legislation. It's always the same. In the case of uh, uh, in the case of uh, climate change, it's exactly the same. You have said, well, let us defend the planet. Second, well, I know that if you make this, this regulation to the South, the South could not take the burden of it. Third, but anyway, uh, it's not a reason for the refugees to come at our, in our country. Such, so four, we are ready to pay for adaptation of Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, Turkey, etc. That is what we call the um, policy for uh, neighbor, the neighbor policy. There's a huge contribution of Europe to Mediterranean countries in order to adapt in the south while mitigating in the north. Other questions? Are there other questions? Hi, my name is Alessandra. Um, my question is on the cap and trade system. Um, I'm from Brazil, so on the trade part, I'm a bit worried about how you mentioned, like in after the crisis, how the rights to pollute they fell, but the price fell a lot. Um, and um, your, I mean, I'm not in favor of us destroying the Amazon and our native people, but. I'm a bit worried that how you convince these countries to rely on the transfer of money through the rights through selling their rights to produce when it's such a uh, the price is so volatile and you would leave these countries virtually I mean you would expose them to even more volatility um, than the country I don't know if there is a crisis um, in w some whichever country. Um, and it reflects on the price of the right to pollute even more. It would be even more volatile for the countries that are transferring the funds or are receiving the funds to uh, of these rights. Right. So, um, and uh, especially being from Brazil, when you maybe combine this dependence on selling the rights to um, pollute to other countries with, let's say, financial openness, the potential of the volatility to create in these countries. Um, and how do you, conv I mean, I, I can see it working maybe the for the countries are in the lower right corner, which are very small, small islands, small countries. Yes, it is. Yes, but I'm talking about the emerging economies um, and um, if countries who would I think would be hesitant to be exposed to and depend on this. Hi, um, my name is Fatima, and I'm from Latin America also, and I'm wondering about the uh, environmental justice, uh, that it was uh, one topic of the COP21, and well, uh, in Ecuador we had uh, some problems with petroleum companies who were um, Ecuador, Yes, and uh, which company had installations and they destroyed some part of the Amazon. And we had uh, some uh, problems in the court in United States, but Ecuador uh, has to pay uh, to pay to that companies instead of, of the American companies pay to Ecuador for all the damage. So that is um, one of the problems that we faced, and that's why uh, the president, the, act, the actual president, and some of presidents in Latin America are worried about that. Uh, what 
what we can do uh, when we affront this damage in in our countries and how to find justice in this uh, in this um, uh, subject because uh, who 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 can say it which is just in in this uh, in, in in this in this problems who have the reason that uh, th that is the problem uh, and also a uh, Another problem that we have is that we didn't find any um, um, any any partner in any other country uh, in the world who can um, be part of our project that it was to maintain oil underground. Uh, it was um, one of the most uh, uh, big a project in Ecuador that the, the government uh, promoted and over the world, but we didn't have any any other country that helped us to promote this. And why is the reason? <laughs> because uh, we thought that uh, developed countries can contribute, but it was not uh, any positive uh, uh, position. Thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe the last one, <laughs> but it's a short one. Uh, it's about uh, uh, Piketty's paper. Uh, he, he wrote, uh, he published a paper just before the COP21 uh, last year, uh, uh, proposing uh, a tax focusing on uh, individual emissions. He says that. Uh, 10% uh, of, uh, of individual emits uh, the, the half of the total uh, greenhouse emission all over the world. Uh, all over the world. So he proposes uh, an individual tax uh, at the world level uh, in order to uh, yeah, to answer to to this, to this problem. And I just want to know what do you think about this uh, proposition, if you have heard about, about it, and uh, if it's possible to implement it? I will answer immediately to this one, because uh, it's a very, that was the position of uh, EU uh, before 92. Uh, the position, well, taxing, as I told you, and Godard demonstrated very easily. Uh, for individual, you are not going to put a cap, because you cannot measure its emission. So you put a tax on its emission. That is, each time you buy oil, enfin, gas, uh, oil, or, or coal, you pay the tax. That's all. And it was in France. It's called a TIPP, uh, tax uh, uh, on uh, petrol uh, products. It exists. Huh? Uh, the proposition of EU before '92 was extremely precise. Uh, it was. $10 by gallon of equivalent petrol, and a form of petrol. Seven it was if it was in form of gas, because gas is less polluting than petrol. Uh, something like 15 or 16, I don't remember, for coal, and 20 in the form of uh, turb. Uh, I don't know what it's called, but you know, the weakly transformed uh, organic matter, which is more or less like uh, carbon, like coal. Early coal, if you wish. <laughs> uh, so that was a position of EU. This is a very old position. And it is implemented. The, the carbon tax, which is uh, implemented now in France uh, uh, from uh, two years ago, uh, uh, as a result uh, of the law about uh, energetical, energetical transition, is the implementation of that. And it, you buy something that produces carbon in gas, you pay a tax at the, according to the quantity of a product. There's a lot to say because, of course, what do you do with um, uh, chloro, uh, chlor uh, uh, hydrochloro products, uh, fluoro products? Uh, what do you do for methane? Uh, etc. There are a lot lack of leaks, but it's a normal form of fighting against. Uh, um, climate change using an economic device, which is in reality a purely administrative device, uh, to uh, foster 
the, the consciousness against the climate change. It's even in Europe, where you need the uh, agreement of 27 countries only <laughs> to have one tax. I, I remember the only tax that I've known in my lifetime in European Parliament was a tax carbon, uh, which was against Poland, mainly. Uh, it's the, the only case where Poland, which was a very newcomer in the uh, EU, which had no capacity to defend itself, uh, which was much depending on the regional subsidies from EU to Poland, uh, because there is a lot of cross retaliation in this kind of negotiation, Poland was obliged to accept the tax on the consumption of coal. But it's the only one, only for coal. And a very, uh, at a level which was uh, not inducing any country but Poland to do something. So, if you, want to try, if you want to try to do that for 120 countries, uh, you can try, but uh, even Fabius would not arrive mm -hmm. to do that, in my opinion. <laughs> now, but uh, you are right that if you can, uh, the first runner argument is very important. If you can gather EU plus United States plus, say, uh, South Africa to do that, it's exactly the problem for uh, airplane uh, uh, flights. Uh, there is an idea of using a tax on airplane flights uh, for financing uh, um, help to the third world, uh, or refugees, for instance. Uh, uh, it's an idea of Chirac. Uh, you can, if you can gather a plurilateral, plurilateral is called in that case, uh, agreement to do that, you may appear as a front runner. You can get a great reputation of generosity, civic sense, and oblige the other country to do the same. But it's really very hard, in my opinion. Now, uh, back to the question of cap for small, uh, not for small country, but for uh, Latin America, which is very important. As you know, I was a president of the delegation of e Europe for uh, Andean community. So I, I was a good friend of uh, um, Ma Ma Maria Fernanda uh, and of uh, Correa uh, before the election, and uh, I was very uh, I, I supported as European representative uh, the ITT project that is keep the oil and the soil, which was the best solution. The problem is that, as you said. You cannot rely ah, to say to some country or to some people, indigenous people, please don't use your forest. Don't burn your forest. Don't use your petrol. Because it's the interest of humankind and of the planet is very hard. Some indigenous people will reply. Um, we have another paradigm. We are not interested in all this consideration. We don't burn our forest because we consider it is a, a part of our body. And uh, we don't uh, spoil the ground because it's part of our body. Uh, this is a, say, a Shuar version, a Shuar, sorry, version of the conception of a relation between uh, humankind and the planet, the nature. In that case, no problem. They will oppose, but they are weak. The indigenous people are very weak in front of, uh, in front of uh, uh, colonialists and uh, the clearest uh, uh, government. Huh? In Peru, in Peru, it's nearly a permanent war between the Desarrollista uh, government and uh, the indigenous people. There is, at each time I went to Peru, there were, at the same time, more than 100 fights on environmental issue. More than 100 strikes or fights in Peru each time I was there. I was there. At the same time. Because everywhere there were mines, there was deforestation, they were killing, they were fishing, uh, small fishes to make uh, uh, food for the cows, etc., etc. So, a permanent fight. 
It was the same for Peru, it was the same for Colom uh, not Colombia, uh, for Ecuador, and it was the same for Bolivia in reality. Uh, so, it was a permanent fight. We in Europe, we were supporting, in general, partly because I had the presidency, partly because it was a position of Europe, we were supporting indigenous people. But how to do? Because there is the sovereignty. The sovereignty is not of indigenous people. It is national sovereignty. And this is a big problem. I was there in Brazil in 92, before the beginning of the Rio conference. I was um, teaching in the Rio Grande do Sul. All Porto Alegre was full of inscriptions. Amazona e Nossa. Yankee go home. Hey. Because uh, some very some uh, actors uh, were coming from the uh, United States to support the indigenous people of Amazonia. And they said, no, the people of uh, Rio Grande do Sul, which are Italian, Germans, uh, etc., uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and recent migrants, uh, they said, Amazonia and Osa. Hey, Amazonia is our, our land. So the problem is who is in charge? Who is sovereign on nature? controlled by or inhabited by indigenous people. Here you have the regulation, the treaty 125 of the WTO, not the WTO, uh, ILO, International Labour Organization. ILO has a convention saying a community of indigenous people has a control on this land and cannot be, be deprived of it without his previous and uh, inf well-informed consent. Previous and well-informed consent. It's extremely complicated. I try to implement that in a, where? Uh, in the north of uh, Ecuador, where indigenous people ask uh, to defend the Valley of San Francisco against a project uh, of uh, mine just in the Parana, that is the top of the Andes which is the reserve of water for the both sides, which was, so it was a condition of a living of all the people, not only indigenous, but not agriculture, ordinary agriculture, uh, both sides of the, and in an English firm was going to put a mine at the top of this Sierra. In the uh, and we, as European deputy, said to all the bodies of financing, that is, World Bank, European Bank of Investment, not to finance that project. And I say to the British government, please try to avoid that. And the British said, okay, we sell to, to China. I said, China. <laughs> the protection of, <laughs> of Ecuador was not its problem. So the problem of ITT. And so you, you are perfectly right that you cannot protect, protect Amazonia by saying it's delivering uh, a protection to the world. Because to the world, on the point of view of by selling uh, carbon uh, gas uh, permits. But you can do it other ways. You can, for instance, and that was the main tendency which we tried to introduce was we can pay the indigenous people for preserving the breath of, uh, <laughs> of a planet, Amazonia. Uh, it is a bit uh, exaggerated from a scientific point of view, but you can say that. We are protecting both biodiversity spot, high spot, and uh, reserves of carbon in Amazonia, of fixed solid carbon, contrary to uh, carbon dioxide. Okay, so first battle, who will gain the money? Normally the state. Normally the state. I had to, fin to finance, in a previous part of my political life, the financing of NGOs in Brazil. The problem is that the money comes from Paris, from uh, Brussels, to, not to the NGO in Brazil, it goes to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Brazil, which gives the money. And each time there was, there was less 
why less 12 persons? Because it was the money, the normal money, that color the mellow at the right to perceive on any money. And uh, each time the NGO said, but we, you, we ask for this money and we get 12 person place. We said, but we send the money. And they said that, uh, that there was a tax of color de mellow. And we said, but we cannot say in our government that we will pay a 12 person tax for the color de mellow, which was the president of Brazil at the time. And th there is a real problem. How can you separate what you do for an indigenous people, people in a country, and what you do from the outside? for a government in a country. Once again, the battle is always inner to the country. You can help from the outside, you cannot help from the inside. But this is clear also for Korea. One, Maria Fernanda, and, uh, Alberto and the others, tried to put, once Korea was elected, they said, OK, we implement the ITT project. The ITT project was to say, we are not going, uh, ITT is a part of a national park, which is extremely important. It's the peak of biodiversity, biodiversity in the world. And they asked, there are unknown population of indigenous people there. You can't contact them. You can't <laughs> negotiate with them because it would be dangerous. It would kill them just by our microbes. So, put on them. The government said immediately, but we have to be compensated. We have to be compensated for that. If we refuse to use the money for the exploitation of this oil field, we are under ITT area. If we maintain the oil under uh, the, uh, the surface, we have to be compensated. We do that for the planet, for the defense of biodiversity, for the defense uh, of the uh, composition, atmospheric composition. The position of Korea was to propose 50-50. And it, uh, Korea, the president of uh, Ecuador, accepted to lose 50% on what could have produced these oil fields, and the rest should be paid by um, by the rest of the world, because it was a service to humankind. So I tried to negotiate and build up the system. Germany was ready to pay. A uh, lot of cities in France were ready to pay. I had a list of people who we were ready to pay. But to pay what? Either Korea would say that this part of Equatorian territory behind uh, the ITT territory would be property of humankind or not. If it remains under the sovereignty of Ecuador, nobody will accept to pay something because they will not pay for a measure which could be abandoned next day after an election or because Ch Korea changed his opinion, which happened very frequently with Korea in its relation with indigenous people, huh? and say, OK, I got the money, and now exploitation of oil. So the only solution which was introduced by Alberto, who was uh, at the time a president of a constitutional court, uh, you do, you, Korea, uh, no, sorry, you want to abandon the land, uh, the underneath land, to a body belonging to United Nations. That was one solution. But it was not accepted finally because it was against the idea, the Latin American idea of sovereignty. But, and of course, it was within uh, Bolivarist ideology where it was extremely difficult to defeat the idea of sovereignty. Of course, for people like, uh, which we support on the side, like uh, Evo Morales or uh, um, Chavez, etc. The idea of abandoning sovereignty to another body, while it was written in the Bolivarian constitution of Venezuela, to, that something could be abandoned to an international body. But in reality, they never accepted the abandonment of sovereignty, which was involved in the ITT, in financing the ITT. And uh, so uh, this is really a problem because it's 
this experiment, which was the best idea of all the time uh, against climate change, was confronted to a problem of sovereignty, which is really the basic problem about fighting against climate change. Okay? Thank you very much.